to be a little bit less lenient though on seeing that the asset growth is largely made up of an increase in goodwill. This is Snowflake acquiring other companies for more than the market thinks they're worth. And again, in this industry, so much small cloud companies, maybe it makes sense, but we definitely would prefer this to be flipped on its head. We'd rather have high quality assets outweighing not such a big deal liabilities. Here we have the opposite, very real, difficult to escape liabilities, growing faster than an asset base, which is just half goodwill income statement revenue growing very healthily year after year and with the cost of revenue growing slightly slower this is leading to a nice looking gross profit there is not money at the bottom of the income statement though there is net losses every single year warren buffett okayed this right almost all of it coming from the row research and development but a lot of the, of the expenses are in sales and marketing as well. Sales and marketing, necessary in an industry like cloud. The research and development could be interesting for us to look into deeper. Because if they're spending this much on R&D, let's hope they have a clear vision for what that is. Statement of cash flows. Depreciation growing very healthily. And for an infrastructure business, that's not a bad thing. The higher the depreciation is, the more baseline level of activity we can assume customers are using on the platform. Now, less exciting is that this stock-based compensation dwarfs not just the depreciation. I mean, it's literally approaching 11 times the depreciation number. That's insane. But it generally dwarfs everything else, including all of the working capital management. Speaking of working capital management, my eye is noticing that the only meaningful thing here is the deferred revenue. Now, deferring revenue does substantially lower your uh, cash provided. So even though the income statement shows this is a company that never makes money, we can actually see here that it actually literally does generate money every single year of this report. And that the money that can be expected to be pulled from the business is very skewed by this deferred revenue. If you can assume that this revenue will be eventually collected, then just right here, this is 1.5 billion of future money that they don't have to do anything. The, that has zero cost basically this is 1.5 billion of future profits i'm starting to understand now what perhaps uh, berkshire hathaway is seeing <laughs> so in conclusion for the opening move i thought r d would be interesting maybe we do still look at it but it's actually dwarfed by the financial impact of this very large deferred revenue so we're a hundred percent gonna look into that deferred revenue and get an understanding. I've scrolled this down to the notes of the item eight, a section just for deferred revenue. The first sentence throws me off immediately because they're in saying that in their deferred revenue figures, they're actually including advances. Now I'm not, I'm not necessarily an English major or anything, but if you're deferring revenue, that's usually not you're collecting money up front. That's uh, almost the opposite of what is usually in deferred revenue. But then a couple of sentences later, they also say deferred revenue also includes amounts that have been invoiced but not yet collected. That's what is usually talked about as deferred revenue. Since they put that second, you could assume that the number we saw on the state financial statements is mainly made up of advances uh, rather than deferred revenue. And it continues to be very different than the usual situation. Uh, the second half of this paragraph is now talking about uh, that the need for using this accounting principle is because a lot of their customers uh, sign contracts on the basis of a capacity arrangement that allow customers to have flexibility in their consumption Deferred revenue, when you take all this together, for this company in cloud actually means how much customers have committed in budget. Weird situation, most cloud companies actually uh, do the opposite. They cap the minimum and then let companies uh, spend as much as they want. I mean, all you got to do is uh, find a programmer who is uh, being lost their life savings because of Amazon Web Services to know what I mean. But Snowflake here very clearly saying the opposite. You spend zero dollars, that's fine. We are going to make sure that if you sign with us, you know exactly what your max is. And then you can end up and then the risk is on Snowflake to then maybe they don't make that much in order to take away the pressure off their customers. Their customers have a certainty in knowing that they're never going to go over their budget because Snowflake is going to not charge them after that point. Control Fing for deferred revenue now. We did find it mentioned in the item seven, thankfully. I wasn't sure if management was going to specifically talk about it, but I'm very glad that they did take the time to, to write something. And what they actually wrote here is that customers sign these capacity arrangements, these contracts for one to four years, and they give most customers the option to roll over their un use capacity for future periods since they allow this which again is nice for their customers even if you sign a new contract with them as an existing customer deferred revenue accounting will only capture the difference in size of the contract 
Uh, for all of these reasons, they're actually simplifying it to potential investors, and I appreciate this. Telling us, don't look further into this really unless you're nerdy. Uh, we believe our deferred revenue is not a meaningful indicator of future revenues. So already, let's go back to the drawing board. I thought what we were seeing here was a case of the Berkshire boys, the, the prodigies, noticing that the market was undervaluing deferred revenue. The management, very pessimistic about that stance, saying don't consider this future revenue. Now, however, they're tracking this. It's meaningful for the company. This is actually so unique that they clearly have spent a lot of time setting this up for themselves, this accounting style. I'm going to actually push back and say that the management, I appreciate that they're trying to simplify here, but there still could be some element of people underestimating how much of this deferred revenue will actually turn into profit in the future. But we did also see some interesting stuff happening in the research and development. This company boldly betting that its research and development is going to outcompete other uh, cloud startups. So I've controlled that for research and development. The categories that they themselves described for their R&D department is that they have R&D in data science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Now, I'm actually quite curious, uh, how specialized are they trying to be? The actual number we saw in the income statement is broken up into salaries, benefits, bonuses, additional stock-based compensation that wasn't tied into the cash flow statement, research and development expenses, consultants using other cloud infrastructure, uh, third-party cloud infrastructure, what? I thought you guys literally did that. Amortizing intangible assets, I mean, those are the acquisitions, and then software subscriptions for the personnel of the R&D organization. But what? You don't usually say something like, we expect that R&D expenses will increase in absolute dollars. But you've already decided that, okay. Now, we saw that there is healthy revenue growth here. So this is okay, I guess. But returning to the income statement, spending 800 million more in the last two years on GS, the research and development line, when your gross profit is only increased by 1.1 billion, that's a very high ratio. You're spending like what, 70, 80 something percent on research and development without taking care of any of the sales and marketing, any of the general administrative, which is pretty tame in this company, to be fair. You could argue that the last few years have been an exercise in squeezing every dollar into the salaries of the employees. Not bad. I mean, great for the employees, and I'm sure they deserve it in all sorts of ways. But it doesn't leave much for uh, this magical growth that they're talking about. In a lot of ways, this company is giving me Apple in the 90s vibes. In that very specific case, in that very different industry, we can say that an Apple investment would have been worth it in the 90s for most people, but not necessarily because they were doing this. Uh, it's kind of the uh, the App Store kind of saved Apple despite doing this sort of stuff. And yeah, we got phones and you could definitely argue that they wouldn't have even seen the App Store opportunity if they hadn't have been spending so much money on developing their version of a smartphone. It's tough. It's tough. Basically, if we do compare this to Apple, what we've got is a cloud company that is goofing off. No, they're not goofing off, but like uh, experimenting so much that the best hope is that it helps them pivot to a new business model that will actually make them money. But I'm not getting the sense that this company is actually going to make much profit in the cloud. I'm getting the sense that Snowflake here is genuinely trying to find a, an indus a new industry adjacent to cloud and, and look at the future that way. You know, I was recently talking to a friend about how nice it would be to have a mentor. And the truth is we all have all sorts of mentors. But while we were discussing this, my friend was really kind of bringing up this idea that if your mentor can be even above average slightly, it makes a huge difference. And I wasn't so sure that it would. I'm, I'm one of those guys that thinks it's just all about personal responsibility. But that was just a couple of days ago that we were debating that. And now here we're looking at some of the mentees of the man himself, Warren Buffett. Now, as a value investment channel, I wanted all of us to learn from these uh, protégés. And I think we are. This company is going to make or break based on the specific niche details of its research and development department. I'll be the first to put in my hand and say that would take a lot more research effort than I have currently done. So the story behind the numbers here is that this company should not necessarily be evaluated based on the numbers. However, I'm also a believer in the numbers. I'm definitely curious to see what the ACs AI is going to think about this. I'm going to try to guess though, um, and I'm feeling confused because how bad can it be? I mean, Berkshire Hathaway is investing in it, right? It's literally never recorded a profit. 
And the reason for that is that it's extremely generous to customers and then spends all of its money paying very high salaries to R&D people. We've seen businesses like this over and over again, and they do look to explode at some point in the future, either for good or bad. And so for that volatility reason, I'm actually thinking it's not going to score super high uh, despite a pretty healthy looking cash flow statement. I mean, the cash flow statement was good, wasn't it? Duh. I'm getting quite, quite unsure here. So I'm going to have a pretty broad range. Um, I'm thinking this is going to be between the 20th and 60th percentile. And I know that's pretty broad, but I'm just genuinely not sure. But what do you think? Say Seeds AI is going to give us a valuation ranking. Say Seeds AI is trained to identify value investment opportunities. Tell your friends about it. Take a guess. Ask them to take a guess too. And whichever one of you gets closer to the actual Say Seeds AI ranking is clearly destined to be a financial sage. Snowflake is ranked in the 86th percentile. It's so lower, significantly lower than what even my broad guess was guessing. And a genuine surprise. It's been a while since I've been this surprised by a Say Seeds. AI ranking. Uh, I actually thought I knew a lot. I looked at many, many cloud companies, none of them quite like this. Uh, but yeah, this one's quirky. And apparently Safe Seeds thinks it's quirky in a not so hot way. Now I do know that Safe Seeds would find this R&D game to be a financial risk because frankly it is. If it works, it works. But every month or day that it doesn't work, is not great from the financial perspective and so it's generally i you know i kind of agree i don't i don't i wouldn't want to be investing in a r d team no matter how great they are that has very real pressures uh where like time is going to be playing against them basically now i'm sure if snowflake is aware that that pressure will bound amount i'm sure they have their pizza parties or whatever to help relieve the tension and i'm also thinking snowflake absolutely has to continue to show up in future seasons because this is a low ranking i'm still surprised I don't think I fully get it. And it could be the case that some non-quantifiable element of the company is going to blow this up in a positive direction. And we'll all be talking about how the Warren Buffett proteges have got it. Either that or they're genuinely confused. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. See you all in future videos.